I had just reposted this video on LinkedIn of the statues of Roman emperors, and then they morphed the faces onto them so you can actually see what they sort of look like. And I was really excited. But then I look at the comments and people start blowing up. One says, these were Italian Mediterranean men, yet they all have very Northern European complexions. And then another ups the ante says, by the, the danger lies in the fact that the more people see this kind of crap, the more they actually believe. Stop the music. Are they all right? It's, why did this simple image trigger people? And what could we actually learn about creating graphic images, any sort of content with Gen AI? Well, in episode 42, let's dive into true life history and Gen AI mystery. And at the end, I'm going to show you how to unravel the mystery in a four-step process. But now let's look at the beginning, at the source, where this all began. A man named Daniel Borchardt lives up in Canada, pandemic 2020 hitting, and he decides to do these portraits of Roman emperors. And the story that unfolds here is amazing that four years later, I'm seeing a revised and less effective version. And what Daniel did can show you how to use Gen AI to be a little bit more effective. So I went back and found an article, AI resurrects 54 Roman emperors in stunning lifelike images. And as you see, here's one of Caligula. You see on the left, there's a statue. And on the right is a drawing, for lack of a better word, of what he looks like. So what Daniel did was not only take an approach of let's get these statues, but took a very good Gen AI approach of noting that you get garbage in, garbage out. So when he was doing a statue, it was really important to have the headshot like this, a little side face, a little side face, so you can see the proportions, but also to have well-lit photos of the statues, because other than that, you're going to lose detail. It just isn't going to become accurate, and we all know how troubling Gen AI can be to be accurate. So... By doing this, he had to use a tool called Art Breeder. Now, Art Breeder is actually a tool, as you can see today, that's evolved even further than when Dan used it. And by probably using what's called Poser, putting a pose, the statue, a face, the modern face in this case that was on my LinkedIn post, but Daniel went a little bit further. I'll show you that in a second. He was able to use Art Breeder as sort of his chat GPT of the time to be able to create these images. But as we go back to the article about him, what's interesting is he talks a lot about the sources he used. And this is a great point of view using Gen AI. If you're going to create an image or even an article, the better you can paint the picture to AI of what you're looking for, the clearer you can communicate, just like you would to a human being, the better it's able to understand. And so what he was able to do is go back to resources because nobody really knew what these Roman emperors looked like, what their ethnicity was. Sometimes but it was a little bit different than we understand it today. What the skin tone was, how they actually looked, what the facial features were like. All of this, Daniel did his best to really go deeply into it and find out the best images and create this. It shows you a way to use Gen AI to your advantage. So this is an example of Daniel's pay paper on Medium that he posted. And if you're not watching the video, I'll explain it through to you. So using the neural net art breeder, you see a series of images. Here's one of Nerva, and we'll click on it, and you basically see the statues that he used and then how he was able to draw it. And he showed his sources, where he went back to, really using as best he could little descriptions. Was somebody, for example, had freckles. Um, some others would look very different. Hadrian, for example, which is a famous one, and I'm showing it if you're watching the video. There's a young Hadrian and an older Hadrian. So what he was able to do is take this and actually try to almost get a really good image, even though with Art Breeder, he couldn't really pick ethnicity. He couldn't pick skin tone. It wasn't like a variable. Maybe it's included today, but that gets really tricky. But what's funny is his audience, because this is related to history, the content he was creating wasn't allowed to not be true. And as my one commenter said, this is really nuts. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? Because it's almost offensive because it rewrites history. Well, that may not be accurate, the threat that AI brings, are we just going to put a modern 21st century face to somebody from almost 2,000 years ago and make them look like a white Northern European when it was clear they were more from the South, from Spain, from Italy? These are the kind of things, as a takeaway, if you're doing your Gen AI, you could use AI to do historical research. You could use it to get some of the details 
like Daniel did, of what things look like. But here's the funny thing. You got to be really careful of the sources of your details, which is brutally, brutally hard. Now, this article that you're seeing from David Kochi, and I have links on the blog post if you want to see anything related to this pod. Were Roman emperors blonde? That was his question in 2020 to this article and to Daniel's work, which he actually respected. He wasn't actually coming after Daniel. He knew he tried really hard. But what happened was the sources of data, and as I scroll down here, you find down at the bottom this spreadsheet that Daniel had used, and this spreadsheet shows the different sort of Roman emperors, what they look like, and some of the indications. But what was funny is, as John points out in this article, criticizing the efforts to make them look what he still said was almost Nazi-ish, Aryan-ish, because the source of this was a site that was actually drawn towards creating these sort of images of what historical people would use using the Aryan image. And he says, to sum it up, out of 46 emperors, for which we have a recorded physical description, only four can be described as having fair hair or blonde. They weren't that color of hair. Only four out of them. And you clearly see a lot of brown and blonde hair coming out because the influence is here. Somebody's looking at history and wants to imprint their idea in this case, sort of the Aryan, I won't say it's Nazi, but that Aryan racial preference in the site is very clear. And they're trying to make this for people to look at history and say, this is what a Roman emperor would have been blonde, just like a, an Aryan. Now, taking that away, Daniel didn't do anything wrong, but he didn't know that that source that he quoted and got it from, I mean, he's doing a lot of this work on his own during the pandemic. This is just a fun project. And when this was pointed out, this is one of the greatest parts of your doing Gen AI or creating anything, listen to your audience. So on the top of the article I showed you originally, there was an update Daniel did literally a few days after the article came out against him. And he says, because of this source called the Apricity, he entirely removed that spreadsheet because John had made a lot of valid points, was very thorough, and was not, was, again, we're talking about the AI skills, critical thinking, adaptability. John was able to give him input, and the beauty is Daniel took it in, took that source out, took it out of the photos, and also took out another source that John correctly said was not really accurate or to be trusted. So in the end, by listening to the audience, by taking the feedback, not just from AI, but human feedback and not fighting it, you're able to actually create something that's better. And this is what we're talking about. In fact, let's sort of bring it down to how this is going to work for you. This is Daniel Voshart's store on Etsy where you can still go and buy prints. So he created the prints. Now think about this. As an entrepreneur, I love this because he's in the pandemic. He's doing a ton of work. I think it took 16 hours per image to take these into Photoshop because that's how Daniel took this outside of Art Breeder and improved it by putting his own input, which is what happens repeatedly with AI. Comes out with something, but the skin tone, a lot of the things, the hair, Daniel was able to do it a lot better with Photoshop. So his human input, adapting, editing, updating, working with the images, was able to take those and at least give it a closer approximation of what they might look like. So what you see here is a store he created where he's, it says like uh, 1,100 sales and products ranging of posters from about $35 to $55. But here's the thing I wanted to point out to all of you creator influencers. That invoice for an image license, what he does is he'll give you the image for a fixed price. You could do an NFT and all that stuff. But what he does is actually give you the right to print it out yourself if you're really into it. And I have no idea what his sales numbers are, but from an entrepreneurial viewpoint, he did a pretty cool job of really making this work and turning this into sort of a side business with publicity given by the fact that he stumbled a little bit, went to some sources that others pointed out were not good, and he fixed them. And then he used his own ingenuity to do it. See, that's what Gen AI is about. Taking content in, putting yourself into it, and coming out with something better by working together. So Daniel Beauchart used a combination of AI systems like Art Breeder to generate photorealistic facial models based on ancient Roman statues. 
but his approach went simply beyond the AI output. The four recommendations I want to make to you when you're creating anything with AI, content, images, articles, summaries. Number one, always look to improve the data training. It's obviously always about the training. Daniel created the data set of quality statue images, what he calls no garbage in, garbage out, right? Because if you put bad stuff in, in his case, uh, statues with lots of shading on the face that weren't really clear, it wasn't able to pick up the facial images. So care about that. So he also saw that early AI skin tone renderings from what other people said, some even calling it racist, looked pale and chalky. But he started taking portraits of more swarthy Roman emperors so he could have a diversity of data. Again, that corny word diversity comes in again and again. How can you give it more real data rather than based on what it knows, which is, in this case, was often white Northern European males? Number two step you want to take, you now improve the data training. You always want to think, how can I put better data in? How can I improve it in number one? But in number two, always step-by-step -step refine the AI outputs. Daniel could not get everything he wanted out of ArtBreeder as good as it is. And for all the tools I've used in images, music, video, you rarely, if ever, just press a button and get it, even though the expectation, oddly, out of those people who don't use it much, is that it's like a magic trick. So don't fall into that. He used Photoshop to be able to put skin tone, to be able to play with the hair, to try to get it more accurate. And to the point of true life history, Gen AI mystery, the mystery is helping Gen AI discover all of this. The mystery is the details. What he's talking about is those details help you refine your AI outputs. And he was able to incorporate something that was a lot more realistic. And look at 1,100 people bought it. Shows the quality of what he did. Embrace the feedback, number three. This is really key. It's so hard for us to get feedback. As people, it's, it's not fun to get feedback. But if you're going to be a critical thinker, if you're going to be adaptable, you have to let that part of you go. Let it sort of pass through. It's not personal. Hopefully, on social media, it can be. Let it pass through and let yourself understand that that feedback is to get a better result, that you don't get it in the first try, second try. A lot of times over a little repeating usage and prompting and changing and editing like Daniel did, you're able to look, turn that feedback into something that makes your project way better than it was before. Finally, be transparent. He cites his historical sources. And when he learns that part of the spreadsheet he got was from a site that some would consider Aryan and racist, and he agreed, he realized that they were trying to skew history in a way. It wasn't something as he's running around to get, he did on purpose, but he found, agreed with it, and a couple of other sources that weren't as accurate. He listened to the feedback. And that's what I want to tell you, how to work with AI. If you're going to be a collaborator, you don't just collaborate with AI, you collaborate with the audience. You let them give you feedback. And if you're lucky enough, like Daniel, he also discovered number five bonus here to create an Etsy store and to actually sell 1,100 objects at about $35 or so a piece. Plus, that, remember that really brilliant idea. If you're creating images, sell a license so people can download them at a premium price. In his case right now, $114. And his work shows so much of his own input, which is why it came out. Everyone really respected him. And it actually led me four years later to run into his work where somebody else was trying to outdo him, didn't do it as well as he did. But also, it was the pandemic. He had a lot more time. So listen to this, and I'm going to leave you with a little short uh, video, UDO audio that I created. If you're listening at the end, have fun, and we'll see you next week. I'm thinking cold, don't need applause in my function. Innovations. If my algorithm balance, I should grade them. Neural networks weaving. If I process in the maze, doing what's been coded, your judgment's not in my equation. And my vibes converse. You can skip the formation. All eyes on screens. Hey, as I swept through data, but I'm not where it is.